Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first meeting of the Democracy Policy Network's Social Housing Working Group with 38 states and 200 leaders and staffers represented. We think this may be the largest gathering of state legislators, staffers, and other state leaders interested in social housing ever. Um, this is all the states that are represented so far, unless there were final uh, stragglers. Very exciting. Social housing is an idea whose time has come. A quick technical note, we are hosting this as a meeting instead of a webinar, so you can see each other's faces and know you are not alone in your interest in social housing. But to make that work, we need everyone to stay muted. Um, if, if you want to have your video on, though, it adds to the ambiance. Um, a bit on the Democracy Policy Network before we begin. We are an interstate policy network that works to empower people to raise up ideas that deepen democracy. And we mean deepen democracy in the broadest sense of the term, more power to more people in more ways. We do this by first gathering packaging and organizing transformative state policies. And second, we get those transformative state policies in front of folks like you policy-minded, democratically-spirited state leaders and staffers. Now on to the mission of this working group, particularly here today. We want to help raise up policy around social housing in your state houses in the coming uh, session. It's Here's the roadmap for this working group. It's going to work like a funnel. Today, everyone is invited. We're going to have a broad briefing on the content of social housing and effective strategies for raising it up in your state house to pique your interest. Um, then we're going to end the session with, uh, you know, testing the waters of who's interested in getting serious about this in the coming session, who wants to take this to the next level of raising up social housing in 2022. And we're going to invite those, that smaller group of people to stay in touch, come back for a more intimate session where we get down to brass tacks on what you need to make that happen, really particular questions needed answers, needed answered on the content, what talking points work best, answers you need to draft legislation. And for those who follow through after that, we're actually gonna keep meeting and, and really get everyone in the loop to coordinate around uh, launching social housing legislation in multiple state houses at the same time and find, uh, for lack of better words, synergies, sorry for the corporate word, but um, between, you know, sharing materials, shared access to experts, tipping off national press that something is happening. Um, but today we are focused on a broad briefing. I'm going to finish up this intro. We're going to do a policy overview. We're going to do a strategy overview. We're going to talk about the working group next steps and have that moment where you can say I'm interested. And we're going to end with an audience Q&A and get everyone out of here by uh, the end of the hour. So let's get started with our experts. We're going to have about 30 minutes of them sharing, followed by a Q&A, as I said. And we begin with Tara Raguvir, director of KC Tenants a Kansas City tenant organization and director of the Homes Guarantee Campaign at People's Action. Tara is going to start us out with the why of social housing for a few minutes, um, which is why is social housing even being discussed now? What is the broad outline of the housing crisis we are facing? So Tara, why don't you take it away? Thanks so much, Pete. And it's great to be with you all today. I'm gonna start with a quote and I'll tell you who it's from after I say it. Housing shortage is no accident. It is a necessary part of the social order where private splendor and public squalor is the order of the day. Only forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions will enable us to solve this problem. So these are words stated by my maternal grandfather in a speech in Mysore, India in 1977. And I share that to say that this problem about housing shortage and private splendor at the cost of public squalor is not new at all. You may or may not agree with my grandfather's diagnosis about what we need to do to solve it, the total overthrow of all social systems. But one of my answers to how we solve this is social housing. And I'm so excited to be on a call with so many people who are thinking deeply about how to introduce this idea at many different levels of government all over the country. 
So uh, just to reintroduce myself, my name is Tara Raghavir. I'm the director of the Homes Guarantee Campaign at People's Action. And I also have the honor of organizing alongside tenants like me in Kansas City, Missouri, in an organization called KC Tenants. And at every level of my work organizing tenants and as a tenant myself, the core problem is clear. Racial capitalism underlies our land and housing policies, forcing people we all know and love into impossible choices between the food and the rent, their health and their homes. So real justice is predicated on our commitment to unravel this rotten system of racial capitalism and to imagine a, a, and win a different way forward. And to me, a huge piece of that equation is social housing. So the Homes Guarantee Campaign that I organize with at the national level has a simple premise. We live in the richest country in the history of the world. We can and we must guarantee that everyone has a home. But of course, this simple premise is complicated by what I like to call a conspiracy of the profiteers who have stifled our imagination to the extent that we actually can't conceive of housing as anything but a commodity controlled entirely by the private market. And we think of it so much so that way that we can't design policy that would actually guarantee housing as a human right or transform it off of the private market and deliver it as a public good. So the Homes Guarantee is a campaign that aims to uh, create the political space and the, uh, the kind of people power to uh, facilitate that transformation of housing from commodity to public good and to guarantee housing as a human right once and for all. So I'm here to talk more about the why. So I'm going to tell you more about the bad news. And of course, many of you already know every piece of this and many different iterations of it in your, um, in your context, wherever you might be. But right now, of course, our country falls woefully short of delivering on this promise. Um, I'll share a couple of stories to kind of reiterate a, a few of the different perspectives that have shaped my thinking on this. Tiana Qual Caldwell is a brilliant leader with Casey Tenants. She's actually just in the other room as I speak. She's the descendant of slaves, the granddaughter and daughter of veterans who did not benefit from the GI Bill. She grew up in poverty in Parsons, Kansas. Tiana was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in the spring of 2018 and forced into an impossible choice that way too, too many Americans face between in taking care of her health or paying the rent. And she chose to live, but that came at the cost of her home. I think about leaders like Vernell Robinson, who's a public housing resident in Queens, uh, New York. Vernell survived Superstorm Sandy and experienced undrinkable water and mold after the storm worsened the city's already crumbling public housing. I think about leaders like David Zoltan, who is a leader in Chicago, who was injured on the job, lost a leg, and discovered that less than 1% of all apartments in Chicago are both affordable and accessible to people with disabilities. He finally found an accessible place to live, but it costs him over $1,000 a month, and his monthly disability check is only $950. And then last but not least, I think about leaders like Jermaine Abdullah, who once he got out of prison, lived in a homeless shelter for almost three years. The shelter was filthy, the roof leaked, roaches crawled on the sink and toilet seats, and to Germain, the shelter felt like prison all over again. So these are just a couple of stories of the probably thousands that I've encountered over the last several years of organizing tenants, all of which add up to this bigger story about racial capitalism and the untenable nature of today's housing system. Also, it's important to note that these stories are not isolated or extreme, but rather very typical outcomes of America's systemic and racialized housing emergency. And of course, I would be remiss if I did not mention that, of course, that this failure is more pronounced now than ever before during a raging pandemic where tens of millions were laid off, people got sick and died, kids were sent home from school. In the absence of a vaccine at the beginning of the pandemic, Housing was the vaccine. We were all told to stay home in order to keep ourselves, our neighbors, and our communities safe, right? But for so many of us, that was never an option. For so many of us, that option was stolen in the middle of the pandemic by landlords who cared more about their profit than they did about our lives. In my hometown, Kansas City, where I organized, tenants were being evicted throughout the entire pandemic, even with a federal moratorium. And what we came to, the clarity that we came to was that with every eviction we allow, what we're saying as a society is that a landlord's profit and their property is more important than a human life. To me, that's not okay. 
And I think for many of you, that's not okay too. So we have a vision for a better world. We have a vision for a world where housing is guaranteed as a public good. Critically, this vision didn't just come out of my little head. It came from people like Jermaine and Vernell and Tiana and David, some of the folks I named before who wrote the vision for a homes guarantee, which includes a call for at least 12 million new units of beautiful, well-maintained, sustainable, accessible, safe, gorgeous, uh, warm, uh, music-filled, good smells-filled social housing all over this country. Thank you. Thank you, Tara, for that pressing articulation of the why of the crisis that we need to address in the coming years and because it's an emergency in the coming sessions um, that, are, that are happening in the coming year. Um, we now move from the why to the what. Paul Williams is here. He is a social housing expert and fellow with the Jane Family Institute. Paul, could you lead us through the details of what social housing is and particularly how states can play a role in it? Thank you, Paul. And Paul, be sure to unmute. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, you're coming through. OK, great. So I, um, my name is Paul Williams. I'm a fellow at the Jane Family Institute. Um, I live in New York. Uh, before starting as a fellow at Jane Family Institute, I, I worked at the Chicago Department of Housing uh, in the policy division there uh, for a number of years. Um, and for the past three years or so, I've been really trying to push for uh, state governments and municipalities to find a way to do social housing like we, uh, like Tara explained how we need for uh, people in the United States and uh, researching what social housing looks like um, in some places that it's been successful around the world and what lessons we can draw from that. Obviously the United States context is very particular um, and you know you can't copy and paste any model from anywhere but there are a lot of lessons to learn. Um, so I have four big picture questions that I kind of want to frame what I'm talking about as. The first one is where do rents go? We have a market system today almost entirely. We have a small amount of public housing. What is the role that rents play in the housing market and what is the role that rents play in a uh, social housing system? Um, the next two questions, what is the resident's role and what is the state's role? Uh, a social housing system is a, is a public enterprise and there is a strong and important role for the residents of the buildings and there's a strong and important role that the public sector needs to play. And the last question is a little bit more of the brass tacks. How do we do it? What, what do you know? If you are state legislators, you are city council members, what does the bill that you want to put forward need to have in it to allow your public sector in your, in your state or city to actually do this work and deliver for deliver housing for the many. So this first question of where do rents go, um, this chart on the right, some of you may have seen, uh, I know some of you are familiar with this paper from the People's Policy Project from 2017 uh, from Sersha Gowan and Ryan Cooper. The, the, I have a chart here, this, this is just the kind of market model. So rents are collected by the property owner and an equity investor and whoever else invests in the deal. Uh, rents beyond operations and debt service costs just go into whoever the owner's pocket is. Um, as property values increase, that money just flows into the property owner's pocket. In a social model, you have a different situation where we have, uh, th there are people who, are low income that can't afford to pay um, the rents that are needed to pay down uh, you know, the cost of, of building the building and of maintaining the building. 
um, and there are people who can afford to. And so with a single, with an, a social owner, you can cross subsidize your property where there, you, you don't need, uh, you know, addition, all these additional subsidies, you can, you can have, um, you know, some folks who are paying the higher rate and you can have some folks who are paying uh, the lower rate. And that allows you to get, get to the uh, level of cost that you need to meet. Um, so, you know, the idea with this is that, that, uh, you know, you can have the rent spread like this across a single building, but if you're thinking bigger in terms of the scale that we really need to get to, um, to provide real housing for the many, you can think about this same approach in terms of a whole portfolio, a whole uh, city of social housing, right? You may have some buildings where you have a slightly bigger mix of lower income people. You may have one building that is, you know, specifically for formerly homeless people um, uh, with, you know, social service needs and all these things. And you may have some other buildings where you have a slightly higher mix of the market rate tenants. And you can, you know, when you have this one big owner, when the municipality is the owner of the portfolio or the state is the owner, you can spread across the entire city or region or state. And so that's, I think, an important point that I want to get across that is, you know, specific to uh, the American context in, in a couple of ways. Um, the role for residents, this is, you know, we all know how it works in the market model, the ability that um, tenants have to exert control over the places where they live in, and for the most part, uh, that control is very small, if anything. Property owners make decisions on common area rules, prioritization of repairs, when to make capital investments, if at all. Um, property owners set rents according to the market dynamics that they listen to. Um, they determine their own tenant selection criteria, their rules. Whereas in a social model, um, <laughs> there is a much stronger role for tenant associations and community organizations um, who are living in those buildings um, uh, or who you know, work in the neighborhoods where those, where those buildings are. So you know, there are a number of examples from around the world where uh, rents are set in social housing properties in negotiations with tenant associations one example in, in uh, Sweden, 95% of all renters are represented by a tenant association and rents for all of the social housing properties as well as for uh, market housing properties are set in negotiations with those tenant associations. And, and this is one thing that uh, I think is very important in, in our bills as we're advancing this, uh, these ideas to uplift the power of tenant associations, um, creating structures where we give tenant associations um, the, you know, the right and the power to negotiate uh, on these things allows that tenant association movement to grow uh, and expand even you know, further into you know, market housing. Um, what is the state's role? The three big things are the state needs to finance the purchase or construction of housing, whether that's um, you know, buying existing housing and uh, rehabbing it, or whether that's buying land and constructing new housing, the state is going to foot the bill in, in the way that we um, do for certain kinds of affordable housing and public housing today uh, through bonds, loan funds, grants, things like that. The second thing, like I said earlier about having um, a portfolio where you have some higher mix buildings and some um, lower mix buildings, right? You may have some, some property where it's a, uh, a lot of very low income folks and some property where you have more moderate income folks. Having the properties in a common portfolio is specifically what allows you to um, do that cross subsidization across all of your social housing. When, when we have this kind of patchwork of a bunch of little different owners all having their properties scattered around, you don't, you aren't able to do that, um, that cross subsidization mixing that you're able to do with a common, 
common owner. Um, and the state also is able to uh, create structures. We're able to create structures where um, the bargaining process for tenant associations is baked into uh, the way that the, the agency operates. Um, and these last two things are a little bit more down to brass tacks. How do we do it? What, what authorities do we need to give to a social developer from legislation? And the four key ones I think are acquire, own, and lease housing. You need, you need, your agency needs to be able to get land and buildings um, or, or get, you know, get buildings or get land and build buildings. Um, provide for the construction or renovation of housing, meaning uh, be able to do uh, bid contracts with general contractors so, um, to be able to finance, uh, outlay the money that's needed to build the building. So bond authority uh, and contracting authority. Um, another piece is obtaining financial assistance. There are gonna be situations where you need operating subsidies you know, for example, you're operating a, a very low income building for formerly homeless folks, you may need more operating subsidy than for a, um, a more mixed income building. And last, arrange for social services, resident services, daycare, for example, through tenant associations or community organizations, you need to be able to, uh, you know, get those services from those organizations who are able to, who are gonna pro provide them for you. Um, and the last piece is, what does the funding look like that we, that we need uh, to make this happen? So there are a couple of successful operations today around the world um, that do mixed income um, or cross subsidization type models. Uh, and almost all of them are, are bond or loan financed. There is a, uh, very, you know, there, there's an older organization in Maryland called the Housing Opportunities Commission that for a long time has kind of uh, not quite laid dormant, but mostly been doing small acquisition rehab projects. They recently created a new um, uh, fund that is allowing them to kind of do this proto-social housing in the United States where they are, they are the builder and the owner of these mixed income properties in Montgomery County, Maryland. And they're really just getting off the ground. And they're basically doing all of this with general obligation bonds. Um, and there's more detail on that that I've written that I'd be you know, happy to share with folks. I know people may be interested in that. Um, and some of the other ways that things are financed around the world is just direct loans from a state or national government um, or loans from government owned public banks. I know in LA right now, there's conversation of, of starting a public bank. That's one thing that is, um, one great thing about having public banks at, at local and state levels is that they can really facilitate a lot of this type of activity um, that really, we really want to occur in our, in our cities and states. And then additional operating subsidies, um, you may want to uh, create a new state authorized grant program to help with some of these operating subsidies, or you may want to uh, do something like give your new agency priority access to the existing operation subsidies um, that go into housing production today, CDBG, emergency solution grant, you know, all these, all these different HUD programs um, that already exist. So, I know that was kind of a lot and I was talking kind of fast um, and there's a lot more where that came from, but I, I really hope, you know, I wanted to lay out some of the, the big picture key ideas that I think we really need to think about and hone in on, you know, as we move from idea into putting actual text uh, on a bill page. And um, so I hope that was helpful and I look forward to thinking through these questions a lot more with all of you. Thank you so much, Paul, for that wonderful overview. And everyone in the audience, remember, this is just a broad overview today. We're here to go into even further brass tacks for your state in future sessions, including all the folks talking here today are here because they're happy to help you 
uh, with this in your state. Now we move on from the what to the how, and we have four wonderful state leaders here today who have fought for social housing uh, in their neck of the woods. Earlier this year, we're going to begin with uh, Assembly Member Alex Lee of California, who earlier this year introduced AB 387, which would have brought social housing to the nation's most populous state. Assembly Member Lee, what was AB 387? Tell us the story of how it came to be and any strategies you've learned along the way. Over yeah, to well, you. Well, thank you so much. Really glad to be here at this working group. I learn even more and more every single day. Um, so I am Assemblyman Alex Lee. I represent California's 25th Assembly District, and I currently live in, and where I also represent, San Jose. The city of San Jose is also the second most unaffordable place to rent in the entire country. And we introduced uh, Assembly Bill 387, which is a Social Housing Act of California. Now, if you look at it today, it's pretty bare bones because it's a placeholder. Uh, our ses legislative sessions are two years, so we've been able to work on it in well, this is, I guess, my first year. So we've been working on it for about 10 months, and we're hoping to have our first big draft of the bill, which is very long already, uh, coming out in January. So it's going to be incorporating a lot of those lessons that you that Paul just actually went over. Um, and in fact, today, we actually just had a select committee on social housing chaired by my colleague here in the East Bay, uh, Buffy Wicks. So we're actually concurrently, while we're working on the bill, having select committee hearings in our state legislative process to educate folks about it and bring more awareness and really combat the narrative that really exists out there. I think the first and foremost thing that, of course, we're really sold on social housing, I think, in this group, and we understand the vision and the benefits can bring, but they're also in this country, obviously, is a lot of baggage from how previously public housing has really stigmatized any government intervention when it comes to providing housing as a public right, housing as infrastructure. Those things have to really combat it, right? So we're doing a dual approach of education, educating our, our, our stakeholders, educating our colleagues, as well as the public, while we also work on the bill. I would say most of the comments today are very positive. And then, you know, here and there, you have people who are very misinformed making comments, and that's just going to be the reality of it. But we really are hoping to push the bill forward and really incorporate a lot of the things that Paul just went over exhaustively. But it's really important that what we're trying to do is create in California, the California Housing Authority, to have a social housing authority that can leverage a giant portfolio of mixed income and mixed neighborhoods out there that can be deeply and permanently affordable. That can also balance, of course, um, tenant protections and also make sure that it is uh, produced by union labor and also that is um, sustainable financially and ecologically. Those are all things that can be balanced, but I think those are all things that can be done because in California, we also understand that while we are an epicenter in a lot of ways of a housing crisis, um, a lot of folks understand there is a need for a solution, and that brings the question of what. And I think social housing amongst all housing groups, whether where, wherever they are on the housing spectrum, agree that social housing conceptually is the place to go. And I'm really leaning on all these folks in this great network to really share best practices if there are. I know um, my colleagues in Maryland and Hawaii have pushed bills before I have. We're all learning from each other. We're all working on the messaging together and figuring out how this can work. Because I really share a goal that we really can have social housing acts done in maybe 10 states in 10 years or something like that, or however Paul said it earlier to me today, 2025, maybe 10, 10 states. But I think we can really have it and roll it up into a national program so that we finally can have all the things we deserve, which is affordable rents, tenant governance, and to make sure that we take back control in our land use policies. Thank you, Assembly Member Lee. So appreciate that inspiring call to action. What a great note to end uh, your section on. We go to the other side of the country uh, when Pennsylvania Senator Nikhil Saval ran for the State House. He emphasized housing as human right. And the way he made that concrete was the idea of to build model no carbon green social housing complexes with ground floor retail services and community spaces managed by public housing authorities, limited equity co-ops, or community land trusts. It's no surprise he's so well-versed because he is an expert on urbanism and architecture even before he ran for the state house. So Senator Saval, could you tell us about promoting social housing in Pennsylvania? How'd you design that plan? How'd you advocate for it? What have you learned along the way? Thank you, Pete, and thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with so many organizers and 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 activists and and elected officials. I, I you know, genuinely would not have thought this possible 
um, several years ago. So I just want to, you know, you know, acknowledge the kind of progress that we've made um, as a as a movement. So again, Nikhil Saval, I represent the uh, first Senate district in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, I was elected last year. My district includes, and started this year, my district includes, um, sent, if those of you that know Philadelphia, Center City, Philadelphia, uh, sort of the downtown, and stretches through surrounding communities. So it encompasses some of the most well-resourced communities in, in the city and state, as well as those that have experienced extreme disinvestment and high rates of poverty. And so the disastrous and pervasive commodification of housing demands a critical response, as I think we can acknowledge at all levels of government. Um, you know, and I think what we have been focused on in particular, because I, perhaps unlike some of my colleagues, we are in the, the at least as a Democrat, we're in, 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 you know, we're in the minority pretty, pretty heavily in Pennsylvania. Um, and there's been a, a pervasive kind of Republican majority for some time. So even within, you know, obviously there are problems within the Democratic caucus, but even in that, in that context, we're operating at a, at a kind of double disadvantage. Um, that said, that doesn't mean that you stop. It means that you have to be creative and, and make a number of different kinds of interventions. So on, on the one hand, we've held sort of educational events of this kind, I would say, um, on, uh, the, on social housing in Vienna. We had experts from Vienna come and speak to uh, Philadelphians and just Pennsylvanians generally. Um, on green social housing at scale, we had a kind of conference on, the, on Via Verde, a project in the Bronx, which is at least a kind of model of, of the things that we wanted to do. But um, you know, overall, our attempt is to lay the groundwork for housing as a right and not a commodity and create a base for housing policy in the state. In a way, housing is one of these issues that is, is squishy in Pennsylvania. There's, there's people are dug in on various other issues, but there isn't like a, a kind of active movement um, it, it, to the degree that there may be around certain other issues. So in meeting the critical moment of the pandemic, our work has been um, on the one hand about making major interventions in the landlord tenant relationship vis-a-vis -vis, um, the power imbalance between landlords and tenants. So we fought, for example, for an eviction diversion program. Obviously eviction predates the pandemic um, with a huge majority of evictions resulting because residents simply cannot afford their rent. And so we've introduced legislation for statewide eviction diversion so that rental assistance is set as a necessary step ahead of eviction. Um, we fought for fair records for renters because even when you are an eviction is filed against you, a mere eviction filing is enough to just, you know, is a mark in Pennsylvania. Um, it actually, you can, you can be denied housing as a result. We fought for fair chance housing, which would ban um, uh, discrimination, um, well, excuse me, uh, create a, a it make it impossible to screen tenants for criminal backgrounds. So create that as a kind of discrimination. And then those are the, those are, in other words, those are attempts to intervene within the housing market itself. Obviously they don't replace it, um, but they start to change the balance of power from tenant, you know, in favor of tenants against, against landlords. Overall, and this is something that we campaigned on as a kind of correlate to the kind of, to the new construction idea that, that Pete mentioned at the beginning of this, or the, in his introduction, which is not only do we have to build new housing, but we have we have an actual housing stock that exists that we have to treat and you know ultimately bring under kind of collective control, and so we're working uh, to create a whole home repairs uh, program. Pennsylvania has some of the oldest housing stock in the country. Many of our homes suffer from mold, leaky roofs, flood water damage, and lead paint. These homes are hard to keep warm in the winter and cool in the summer, which results in crushing utility bills for their owners. And of course, rising levels of, green, of greenhouse gas emissions, which then in turn fuel our climate crisis and perpetuate a cycle of hardship borne by everyone, but disproportionately those who have the least. And so we're working on a program that provides support for homeowners and, and, um, and would create deed restricted affordability requirements if landlords receive it, that would fight Pennsylvania's housing crisis on all fronts mitigate the climate, the harms of climate change and bring much need, needed resources to struggling communities. Obviously in this fight, we face some of our traditional enemies. Um, in the 1937, the fight for the 1937, uh, what became the kind of act that created public housing in the United States, um, Catherine Bauer uh, was, you know, actually was trying to create a model of social housing um, but uh, was stifled by the landlord lobby and by the real estate industry more generally. That's obviously something that we encounter in our work here. Um, but I think one of the solutions that we've been able to find, at least in kind of 
building a broad base of support for the work that we're doing is that, you know, in each program, we're actually getting outside of what is maybe, you know, housing is, of course, at the center of everything, but there may be people might just think of housing as somehow a narrow concern, which it obviously is not. But if so, but if you it, it, it making clear that it touches every aspect of our lives. So, for example, in this whole home repairs program, um, we've we've needed to consider adaptive modifications. How can we let people age in place? How can we make it easier for people? The need for workforce development, the need to actually create jobs around uh, around repairing housing and energy efficiency. How can we create you know new energy efficient appliances that reduce overall greenhouse gas emissions? Fair chance housing is obviously the intersection of housing and the criminal justice system. This both complicates the work and creates intersections and the possibility of different coalitions around the idea of housing. People who fight for disability rights, who fight in the, in the inter, uh, for, um, to, to you know, end mass incarceration, then are also interested in this way um, in housing. Um, one of our more you know, forward-facing tactics has also, of course, just been the use of social media to promote housing. We've actually been able to get secu uh, secure support from our governor, uh, you know, in, in many respects, it can, it can be considered a fairly moderate Democrat for all of our housing policy. Um, and you know, we also have staffed up as an office by having dedicated organizers on our staff. We have a labor liaison, um, assembly member Lee spoke to the importance of union labor and all of kind of the housing work that we do. Um, and we also have a community outreach director who works directly with progressive organizations. And finally, another kind of tactic is that where we can't feel that we are stymied on a state level, we actually support the work on a city level. Can municipalities um, bring certain kinds of legislation to the fore and we support it through policy work that we have on a state level um, and amplify each other's work entirely. Um, you know, there are obstacles that we're still getting a handle on, um, you know, the actual ex expiration of existing housing, affordable housing, the expiring lie tech credits and the like. Um, but, you know, we, we're overall fighting for a housing program in a state that's in crisis. Um, and we know that we can't solve our housing crisis without addressing all the issues that are at the heart of housing, climate, um, aging in place, criminal justice, et cetera. So I think that's how we, we can't solve this crisis by, without attacking all these problems at once. And that's our strategy here in Pennsylvania. Thank you, Senator Saval, for this great example of how this is all a spectrum. You start talking about tenants' rights and power in the short run, and you can start talking about what social housing would look like in the long run, all while building up a broad-based Big Ten coalition for housing justice. Next up, we have another amazing coalition builder for housing justice, Sia Weaver. She's a famed housing justice advocate in New York City, campaign coordinator for Housing Justice for All, which has on its platform social housing, including alternate forms of social housing, such as via a Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. As a longtime housing advocate, Sia, what experiences, lessons, strategies do you have to share about how folks on this call can fight for statewide social housing? Hey, everybody. Um, thank you for putting this together. And thank you for having me on this amazing event. Um, I actually want to start by picking up on something that Nikhil said about, um, about Via Verde and the Bronx. Um, so Via Verde is pretty much a standard tax credit building. It just happens to be green. Um, it's built and run by one of the largest for-profit affordable housing developers in the Bronx and someone who's a longtime target of ours. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not bad housing, but the reason I start there is that it is um, a pretty nice example of some green housing that is affordable um, with some cooperative opportunities inside of it. And it's like 150 units in the Bronx. Um, and the reason I start there is because one of the things that we really need to tackle when we talk about campaigning for social housing is scale. And we are never gonna be able to break the for-profit affordable housing development industry and even the not-for-profit affordable housing development in the industry, um, like the CDC, like not-for-profit landlord community. Um, if we're going like building by building, community land trust by community land trust, um, one example by one example, that is not gonna meet the scale of the need. And, and we're gonna be stuck in this crisis of, you know, who is it affordable to? Is it affordable to the lowest income households? And we're not gonna achieve that like universality and cross subsidy 
at the level of the market, at the level of the city or the level of the state um, that Paul was talking about in his presentation. And so I don't like to talk about Via Verde as social housing, and, and I wish we wouldn't do it because it's pretty much a tax credit building in the Bronx. It's like kind of just, you know, I, when, when that building was going up, our folks were not supportive of it. Um, so the thing that I, the place that I think we need to start at when we start talking about social housing is universal tenants rights. And I don't think that those are a corollary to social housing. I think that they're a precondition. Um, so in 2019, we led a coalition to strengthen and expand rent control in New York State. And I think we have to understand rent control as um, the right to organize in your building, the right to form a tenant union, the right to get together with your neighbors and assert collective, con like collective demands over the building to negotiate with your landlord, and also to put those demands on the state and say the state has a public process and that public process is gonna determine how much our rents go up. So is rent control social housing? No, not exactly. But in New York City, the existence of a rent guidelines board where there's a public process where tenants can collectively demand low to no rent increases, um, the fact that, you know, it takes the entire market into account, you know, instead of just saying like, this is one building here and one building there, what we do with rent control is we take away um, the market power of an entire industry and we tell them this is how much you're allowed to raise the rent. Um, these are the rules by which you have to play. And then by giving renters the right to organize, they can assert their collective vision for what they wanna see in their housing, free from the fear of retaliation and start to like really have those tenant unions that are gonna be the building block of tenant governance over the housing market. Um, and you can't have social housing without tenant governance. We have public housing in New York City, one of the only major public housing authorities left in the country without and over the years, as public housing became more black, um, it became defunded. And one of the first things that got super defunded, in addition to conditions, of course, um, one of the things that became like, eh, not that important, is they allowed the, the, um, the resident governance structure, the resident associations to completely atrophy. So Baruch Houses, um, one of the oldest public housing authority, uh, public NYCHA developments in the country, 6,000 people live there about 250 people voted in their most recent resident election for their resident board. So while the resident boards have this quote unquote official governance um, role, um, because that has been atrophied, the most social, most public housing in the country is not working. And with strong resident organization and with strong um, organizing in buildings, um, the kind that rent control like opens a door to, uh, you can create the political power that's necessary for a social housing project to succeed and to be politically durable for the long haul. So um, when I talk about social housing, the place that I like to start is rent control. I don't like to start. I don't like to start by talking about particular one-off projects that that aren't going to meet the scale of what we need. And so the last thing I'll say, because I know I'm running out of time, is TOPA, tenant opportunity to purchase. Along these same lines. TOPA, the reason it's exciting to me is because it's a right. It's a right for tenants to say, um, you know what, when this building is for sale, we're gonna take it and we're gonna work with all of those public subsidies that Paul laid out and we could turn it into a community land trust. We could turn it into a limited equity co-op. We could, we could turn it into public housing if we want to. That's in our TOPA law, that if the, if the tenants wanted NYCHA to be the purchaser and the developer, that's in the law. Um, but the thing that I like the most about it is it takes power away from the market, right? Instead of the landlord being able to say, we are gonna sell this to the highest bidder, the landlord has to negotiate with the renters first. So imagine if you're on a rent strike, you're organizing collectively with your tenant union and you're on a rent strike. And the first thing your landlord is gonna do, we see this all the time. The landlord is like, fuck it, it's not worth it for me. I'm gonna sell, I'm gonna sell this building. What if the first person they had to offer it to was the tenants themselves? Um, that it increases your bargaining power to have this right of first refusal, to have this right of first offer. And so TOPA in the first instance, you know, it's not about creating, it could be about creating a co-op here and a co-op there and, and, and sort of it is. Um, but mostly what it's about for us right now is about creating rights for renters to exert their vision for what they wanna see over their homes. So we can build those governance structures and we can build those independent political organizations of renters, the founding block of a renters union that is gonna be so, so, so necessary to ensure when we have 
a scalable, beautiful social housing vision the such that Tara described, um, it's politically durable. It's funded forever. It lasts in the way that it needs to. Um, so I don't think, and I'll, so I'll close here by saying that like tenants' rights are not like an additional or a corollary. They are the thing that makes it work. Um, and without it, it's not going to function. Um, it's not going to last and it's not going to work. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Sia, for speaking to a great example of what the political scientist Jacob Hacker calls policy drift. What happens when you pass a policy without having a powerful constituency to back it and make it work? It will drift towards those who have power, which as of right now could mean defunding social housing if we do not also uh, use policy to build up uh, the constituency's power that we care about. To finish us off today on the panel, we have Senator Stanley Chang of Hawaii. He has introduced legislation to create a program called Aloha Homes, a great legislator acronym skill, affordable locally owned homes for all, which he found inspiration for after traveling to Singapore and Vienna to see their social housing stock. Senator Chang, could you tell us about your own social housing journey, how Aloha Homes works, and what lessons you can share with other legislators to bring us home? Thank you so much for that great introduction, Pete, and for having me as part of this conversation. Um, it's such an honor and so inspiring to see so many people who are interested in social housing. That's not something that I would have guessed um, would happen when I, you know, over the last four years on my journey, I feel like it's been pretty solitary. So um, I, I really um, appreciate everything that I've learned from all these inspiring folks who have spoken so far. Um, and I also want to apologize. There's some construction work going on next door. I hope you can still hear me. Um, but so, you know, the state of Hawaii has had a housing shortage for years, for decades, for generations. It's very severe, um, one of the worst in the country. Um, today, three out of the four counties of Hawaii have median home prices over $1 million. And, um, you know, our counties are islands. You can't just drive to a cheaper one. So, um, to give you a concrete example, the house that my father built, he was a state employee um, with one job as UH professor. And um, he was able to buy a home in 1983 that if I were to buy today would take 40 years of my entire income to purchase. And so, um, you know, over the years, people in Hawaii have gone with their gut reactions and kind of uh, done a lot of programs to try to arrest the housing shortage. Um, since I was on the city council in Honolulu, property taxes on non-homeowner occupied housing have are now triple those of homeowner occupied housing. Um, in 1981, before I was born, Hawaii legalized Ohana units or second homes, second dwelling units on every single single family lot. They introduced another program in the city, um, the biggest county uh, called ADUs in 2018 um, with slightly looser restrictions to allow second dwelling units on every single family lot. And um, there was a program called Bill 7 to upzone apartment zones in 2019. And none of these programs have successfully ended the housing shortage or brought down housing prices. And so, you know, in the spirit of the founders at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia um, in Nikhil's district, um, I decided experience must be our only guide for reason may mislead us. Travel to Singapore, um, travel to Vienna to see two models of housing that actually do provide really inexpensive housing for pretty much everyone. 82% of the population in Singapore, 60% of the population in Vienna with no rationing of any kind. And um, basically the two models are quite similar. Um, I would say one of the biggest differences between the Singaporean and the uh, Viennese model is that Vienna is a renter-based model, whereas Singapore is an ownership-based model. And here in Hawaii and maybe in the US more broadly, people wanna own things. Um, that's the American dream. And um, I keep getting told by the state housing agencies that ownership-based housing is much easier to finance because the developer and or the state, whoever's building it gets all their uh, investment you know, um, recouped basically on day one when the building opens uh, versus amortized over many years in a rental type building. Um, but beyond that, Singapore's um, 
a public housing model is pretty simple. They just build enough to meet demand. They sell these units for only about $180,000 for a brand new unit. Uh, that's a three bedroom, two bath, 969 square foot unit, 99 year lease so that every owner is taken care of until the end of their natural lives. Um, and in Hawaii, a state study recently indicated that um, a two bedroom unit could be built at a revenue neutral level um, would cost only $400,000 to buy, which is, you know, not, um, not, you know, a lot of people will still not be able to afford that. But according to our HUD guidelines, that's affordable to 56% of AMI, which is a much lower level than a lot of the existing inclusionary and other um, housing production programs. Um, I was really excited to hear about the focus on urban planning um, earlier in this meeting, and that's, I think, super important. Um, we've been pushing a high density model um, with narrow streets and sidewalks, ground floor retail, no setbacks. The reason for that model is because, um, number one, it's safer. It's the model that um, most uh, cities had before the pre-war automobile era. It has much lower carbon emissions because you can basically take out almost all the carbon emissions from individual car transportation. Um, and we don't have that much land here in Hawaii. So we need to really focus our development on state uh, owned lands near rail stations. So we've introduced this bill for four years now, uh, most recently SB1. You can uh, read that bill on the Hawaii State Capitol website. Um, it actually made it almost the whole way. It made it through the Senate this year and um, to a floor vote on the House. And unfortunately, uh, it didn't make the floor vote on the House. Um, but you know, we've been fighting hard for this idea since 2018 with webinars, with conferences, weekly email newsletters. We've held a delegation to Singapore and Hong Kong. And right now we're doing a virtual delegation to Singapore, Hong Kong, Vienna, and Houston. Um, if you'd like to sign up for our newsletters so you can keep apprised of all of our programming, please visit senatorchang.com and we'd be happy to keep you abreast of all of our, um, of all of our developments. And so um, with that, Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Senator Cheng. What a wonderful note to end the presentations on. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. We've got a wide range of experience with social housing, and those in the audience are going to write the next chapter of this uh, to continue this interstate push to raise these up. Um, for our next step as a group, we want to take a second to ask the audience whether they want to continue on the journey of this social housing working group before we run out of time. So a poll is going to show up on your screen and it's going to ask you if you to choose one of the following three options. Um, one is you're interested and ready to champion social housing like uh, the three legislators here today in the coming session and want to continue working with us. Another is I can't champion it this year, but I really want to start thinking about this and stay in the loop. And the third is you're not interested, stop bothering us deep in. And so if you could fill that out and submit, we'll have your information to follow up, which is good because we have uh, we got so much information in today, we probably won't have much time for Q&A, but that's what future sessions are going to uh, be about. So about 15 more seconds to fill that out, but, and will you do, um, for those who answered one or two on that sheet, um, we'll add you to an email list and keep you updated about future sessions of this working group. And if you want to become a member of Deep and generally for future working groups, you can reach out or go to democracypolicy.network slash join. Um, and again, the way we're going to do this is basically this was a broad overview today for those who answered one and two. Um, we're going to have future sessions or future versions of this that are more intimate, where we're going to get really down to brass tacks on these answers. Everyone who presented today has said, I want to help other people raise up these ideas I'm talking about today. They're all in the spirit of wanting this to be a national interstate push for these types of policies. So we're going to be following up with everyone with contact information for these folks. Um, to get in touch with them. And we're going to be following up for future sessions. We probably have time for one Q&A question, maybe to, uh, if it's about content, we'll throw it to Paul. And if it's about um, strategy, we'll throw it to one of the legislators or SIA. So if you, you want to drop a question in the chat, we can do one uh, Q&A question. But uh, if I'm seeing none, 
we will just uh, say, I'll, we'll talk about next steps basically, which are, um, again, we're gonna follow up with everyone interested in working um, on this, uh, possibly have future sessions, stay in the loop with Deepin. October 27th, next week, we're gonna have a similar working group on democracy vouchers, a transformative idea out of Seattle. If you wanna contact us immediately, it's Pete at democracypolicy.network. Um, and with that, let's see if there's anything in the chat um, coming through for a final question. Um, we have uh, Sam Bell asking, what federal funding mechanisms are available beyond 4% credits and fair cloth to RAD? Paul, would you like to quickly answer that? And uh, uh, if you have an answer sure. to that. Yeah, I, you know, with, with 4% credits are actually kind of an interesting uh, way to think about the way that we, that we build and, and finance housing and, and what is different about social housing. So something that happens with 4% credits um, fairly often is, is you get a, a, uh, a building that is mixed income. You know, you have 50% of the unit, there's a 50% test. You have 50% of the units that are uh, affordable to lower incomes, and you can have 50% that are moderate or market rates. So just with that alone, you have a mixed income. You're able to meet your cost. Um, the 4% credit is ends up being on top of that. So, you know, when we're doing 4% credits for mixed income properties, we're, we're putting additional money on top of something that would already pencil um, out as a development on its own if it were run by a, um, a public sector state developer uh, who was not interested in, in you know, taking some profit off, off the top. These, these mixed income 4% projects are often run by, by uh, for-profit affordable housing companies. So it's kind of this, you know, we're subsidizing something there that uh, in many cases doesn't actually need to be subsidized. Um, but, you know, in terms of that question on you know what federal funds are available right now, um, you know I think I think the biggest thing that states have that's going to allow them to do uh, these types of programs is just their their bond authority um, and their ability to you know uh, bond you know issue bonds against re future rents that will be coming in um, for the buildings, and that's broadly how social housing is financed in, in other parts of the world too, not always with um, bonds, which are different in the United States than they are in some other places, but through loans from municipal or state-owned banks, which is, you know, uh, economically pretty similar uh, situation. Um, but, you know, one other thing, uh, you know, on that federal point, I the way that I think about the federal government uh, plowing money into this in the future is, you know, I, I think that states and cities really are going to be the laboratories where the social housing um, actually picks up and where it starts to work. And as states and cities start doing this on their own, there's going to be a growing consensus of like, what is actually, what is the type of money that's needed from the federal government um, to really scale these cities and states work on social housing um, up? as opposed to, um, you know, a, an approach where, uh, you know, you put down one subsidy and then automatically make every city and state, uh, you know, have to have to use that one thing um, when it may not be most appropriate. So that's, that's my broad thinking. Sorry, we're going over time a little bit. I have a lot to say on that. Thank you, Paul. I'm actually glad we fit in that one Q&A because that is such a good taste of what future sessions are going to be um, with answering questions about these details of how we can, how you want to craft your legislation, what type of talking points we need to focus on, what coalitions to build. So thank you, Paul, and thank you to the whole panel. And I love Paul's me message of the states being the hope uh, for this because this was the moment we wanted to end on, which is all of the men, most of the great transformations in our country started in the states, minimum wage, abolition, suffrage, marriage equality, social security, all started with people fighting in the states. And we just got the poll results back and over 30 
uh, offices are interested and in, uh, in raising up social housing, and 20 more are interested in following along for the future. So if it, even half of those come through, we're going to more than quadruple the amount of states that have active social housing and make a lot more Alex Lees and Nikhil Savals and Stanley Changs and Von Stewart's uh, here today. Um, so thank you all. We will be following up with everyone um, and so appreciate all, uh, all of your interest and the panel's wonderful advocacy on this important cause addressing an important crisis. Thank you all.